Okay, so folks, uh, a lot of fun to be for a second hour here. So uh, I appreciate your presence. Um, I know you folks have other choices. I know you're pressing uh, needs, but uh, we're going to have one final hurrah here. Okay, uh, one last hurrah. And um, I'm going to be speaking about an area really worthy of of two, possibly even three lectures. Um, but um, we only have a fraction of a lecture to give it. And I want to convey to you sort of a, a different set of issues that come in with subconscious um, uh, beyond those with subtyping. Um, we don't have time to go through several solutions for them. But I mentioned, alluded to some in my closing remarks uh, not 15 minutes that's in the other room. Things like use of uh, mixins and traits and another thing is skeletal implementation classes, et cetera. Um, we don't have time to go into those, but I can at least point you to them and I'll be sharing these slides with you. Um, and then I'll offer some closing remarks uh, uh, for the class. Maybe I could ask a bit of help to get the door shut here, um, just so we, we don't have the entirety of the chemistry department and part of the computer science department showing up and kind of cutting it out. Um, okay, so um, we have a, a fraction of an hour and a lot of room to a lot of ground to cover. So I'll I'll just uh, start with um, dive dive right into material. The lighter part we're not going to be able to get to, but you may want to. So we've been talking this last hour and a half, and in those exercises and the lecture before that about object-oriented programming. And we've been talking about polymorphism and creating safe subtypes in the presence of polymorphism, in the presence of the system where you can pass around an instance of a subtype as if it is. Super, an instance of a super type, right? With well, someone using it as if it's an instance of a super type without knowing that it's a it's actually an instance of a subtype. Maybe a subtype that didn't exist when they wrote their code. So this lecture is about a different side of it. It's about the issue of implementation. Not about promises, but about inheritance and implementation. I want to remind us what happens in a language like Java when we declare a subclass. So one thing is, if, if one subclass is is a if, if one class is a subclass of another, like B extends A. First of all, the compiler assumes that the type that that is the contract that we've been talking about the subclass is a subtype of, of that of the superclass. So. One of the things that this means is that a B can be passed around as if it were a what? As if it were a, an A, right? Plus B extends A, so we can pass it around as if it were an A. People are comfortable with that? Yeah. I hope so, yeah. Okay, um, and that's what our last lecture, uh, two lectures, the discussion of that class. But there's another component to this, ladies and gentlemen. And that's alluded to by the second bullet point. The subclass here not only can be passed around as if it's an A, it inherits the implementation of the A. It, it, it reuses the implementation, the, the, the implementation details of A, like the methods and the fields and the and the um, the, and and you know any data within A is also by default available in B, right? If this has a field in it called my double, then B has a field in it called my double that it inherits from there, right? If this has an array in it of ints, B has an array of, it, of ints that it inherits from A. You know these methods here, like foo. 
by default are available in this subclass, right? If this has a foo, this has a foo, right? Okay. Um, and here, the these methods, these fields, you know, they all have to combine to guarantee to ensure the promises and the interface and the contract are are adhered to, right? Or are performed or or honored. Um, so the implementation mechanisms of the superclass are used by the subclass. Okay. Um, and those implementation methods can be overridden, right? You can override this. This can override bar a method that's declared up here in the superclass, right? Can be comfortable with that. But it can also use some things that aren't overridden, right? Like foo. This has a, a B has a foo too. It's just by default this one because it doesn't override it, right? Okay, great. So I want to ask you, if we have this code, so here we have some code um, beyond these classes uh, with A, with B subclassing A, we have some code on the left that uses them. And specifically, there are two methods, Baz and Zep. Okay? Um, so Baz, what it does is it allocates a new class B, an instance of class B, and it calls foo on it. It, it for all the world, it knows it's a, it's a B, right? It calls foo on that B that it's allocated. Which, um, and and foo, you'll notice, is not declared by B, right? So it inherits the one from A, right? And and this one in A, this foo in A that B inherits. It calls off to this dot bar. Mm -hmm. So the question is, in that call to, to foo, it's going to invoke a bar. Whose bar is going to be invoked? Is it the one in A or the one in B? This is allocated to B. Which which one, uh, which of these this is going to call? Because when it's executing foo, it's calling off the bar. Which bar is it going to call? Is it going to be the overridden one, B? Or the original one in A, uh, G. The overridden. It's the most specific one. It's it's the one, the actual implemented type, not the apparent type. Now the apparent type here is also a B, right? And you might might think, well, it's calling it because it's a B. No, it's it's a B. No, 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 no. It's actually because that's that's the, the actual. Underlying type, regardless of what knows it, knows it. So, so that's good. She is correct, completely correct. When B, when you call B dot foo, it calls off to this foo in A, and this foo in A calls bar, and it's calling it on something that truly is the implementation of it is genuinely a B, and it calls therefore this one, not not this one up here, right? When this code was written in class A, it probably didn't even know that B would ever exist. But but because this one subclass did and overrode it, it reused its implementation of foo, it's calling off to the one of the specific type bar, uh, as in B. You understand that? Are you okay with that? Okay, now I want to make sure you, you, you get the subtlety. And a lot of my goals here, so I don't to show you these problems. Of context, but to make sure you're comfortable with it, because I understand that maybe not all these things have been emphasized in 270 as much as they should be. So we have a call to Zap here. Now Zap is a method that's right up here in client class. It it calls it it you pass it a B as if it's an A, right? That's what we can do with a subtype, right? You can pass it as if it's an instance of a sub of the supertype. So class B. This is a B. We have a B. We know it's a B here. We pass it as F, and all it knows is it's an A, right? It calls A dot foo. Whose bar is called by that? When this calls A dot foo, all it knows is it's an A. Calls off the foo here, right? Right? In, in this. And that calls bar. Whose bar is called? Marmic? B's. It's B's. It's B's. Because it's, it may only see it as an A. That's the apparent type, 
but it's actual time. That's what the implication of time is a bee. This is truly a bee cast to that, <laughs> masquerading as an A, as if it's an A, but it, it's secretly it's a B. Really is. Now, we want it to adhere to the guarantees of A. That's what we were talking about last time, right? The promises. But the point is, when, when it calls, when who calls bar, regardless of whether it's in the context of the client code that calls foo, thinking it's an A or B, it's, it's always going to call this most specific one, right? This one here, this actual one. Are we okay with that? Because this is going to build on that understanding. And yeah, it's really simple. So, A dot foo is going to call A dot foo, call G R. So, A dot foo is going to call foo, which is code here that's inherited by B. And when it calls inside foo, it calls bar. Yes, it's going to call B's bar. It absolutely happens. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out, no, it's not a crazy question. I appreciate the question. But object oriented programming mechanisms guarantee that this happens. And there's mechanisms behind the scenes called virtual tables that it keeps around, D tables, they're called in C. And it makes sure that this is the case. Even if it's class A, it's so called B. Even though foo is has is unmodified from class A, it's just been inherited by B. It's in fact calling B's bar because B overrode it. B said basically, I'm using the implementation of A, but I want you to call my bar instead of its bar. This is a this is this is my bar. This is the current bar. This is the bar that applies to me. So when it even though foo, it hasn't changed foo, bar is now calling its bar, the most specific subcode. Okay? I, 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 and I'm glad to go into this more. Yes, Manette. I don't know if you said something wrong, but you said that it is calling the bar in class B because it overrides it. B overrode it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it. That's what happened there. That's what we did. I think it's because B extends A and yes. A equals the bar function, but what's being passed to the full function, A is in class B, not in class C. That's why. Well, foo is not being passed. Like, foo is not being passed anything, right? It's being invoked on an object, and that object is an instance of class B, which has overridden bar. Like, it's the fact that B has overridden bar that means when you have a B and you call foo on it, foo has not been changed for B, right? It's calling this foo, but when it calls bar, it is calling this bar. It is calling it the, the most specific bar because it overrode it. It is this bar. It's saying when you call bar, and I don't care if it's even in code, way up the hierarchy. You know, Z, Q, F, way up there. If it's calling bar, it's going to be uh, it's going to be using this bar. Yes, B. What about And they all overrode bar. It'll be whichever is the most specific one. So if it's an orange, and you call peel. Oh, well, you know it's just a fruit. Secretly, it's an orange. You call peel, and it'll peel it like an orange. If it's a banana, and all you know is it's a fruit, and you call it peel, it'll peel it like a banana. If, sorry? Type of what? Um, well, the, the type is just the apparent type. Like this, this is this is the apparent type here. A here. The actual type is a B, right? The actual type of this is a B that's passed in here, right? And a new B passed in. The apparent type is A, but it dispatches, it calls things on the actual type. Now, who has not been overridden by B, but when it encounters bar, that has been overridden by B and it's calling it. And so it's calling off to the actual type as overridden by by this subtype. And so this is what allows object, I'll be with you in just a second. Um, this is what allows object oriented programming to do things like you don't have to look up what type it secretly is. 
You just call peel, and it will call the right peel. If it's an orange, it'll call the orange peel. If it will peel the orange. <laughs> if it if it is if it's a banana, it's gonna call the peel the banana. If it's a apple, it'll call peel the apple. If it's a mango, it'll call peel the mango. So so you don't have to worry what type it is because each each uh, subtype will uh, subclass will typically override this. So uh, yes. Um, just to confirm, if yeah. we were in the Nevada function, if we were in that to instantiate an object, like they said A A is equal to new A, then it would call uh the oh, yeah. bar in the correct in the correct. If you said A A equals new A and you said A dot foo. Yeah. It's going to call up the foo here. It'll call it with uh, the bar and, yeah. and A because it's secretly, it's the true type of it is an A. Here, the true type of, of what's called here, uh, you know, when you, when you allocate a B and you call Zap with it, the true type of this thing is masquerading as an A, it's being passed around like an A, but it's secretly a B. We know it's secretly an orange. And when you call foo on it, it's calling, B inherits this code. But when it gets the bar, because B overrode it, and it's secretly a B, it's truly a B, it's gonna call bar here. Eh? This is actually really important to understand with object-oriented programs. So I know it sounds funky, but this is how object-oriented programming supports extensibility, amongst other things. How it supports this nice ability to say, feel, feel this. And if it's an orange, it'll feel it that way. If it's an apple, it'll feel it that way. Mango, it'll feel it that way. Jackfruit, feel it even that way. And durian, don't forget that. we will feel it that way, too. For the resulting heavens. No. Um, so, uh, are we okay with this? Okay, so I'm always glad to dialogue with students about this. If, if anyone wants to have an appointment with me to talk about this in more detail, I'm happy to do that. Because it's pretty darn important. If you're going to work with object-oriented languages, this is a source of a lot of bugs if you don't understand this. So in terms of quality, this is very important. But maybe you're starting to realize, maybe the horror is dawning, that actually testing this be a little bit difficult. Um, there, there can be some subtleties here. Okay, so, um, so I want to ask this from the Liskov substitution principle perspective, ladies and gentlemen. Here we have a hash set. Put your hat on as it was half an hour ago. Um, you have an add. You have this superclass hash set. It has an add, and it has an add all. And by the way. Declared that it monotonically is a solid monotonic. You don't have to worry really about that. Okay, and now we want to declare a subclass called instrumented hash set. And we're going to have an add. Okay, you know, we're going to define our own add. We're going to define our own add all. These are going to override these ones, add and add all. We're going to have get add count. Um, okay, um, so if is there anything wrong with this being as a subtype? So it's going to be an incremented half set. It's going to keep track of the number of times things have been added into this class. Okay. This this one and half set doesn't keep track how many times they've been added. This one will. Okay. This this subtype will. It'll it'll add that little spiffy little feature on it. Then it's going to keep track of how many times things have been added. And it's methods like add and add all is just going to delegate eventually to these over here, but but it's going to keep track of this extra info. How many things have been added? Kind of nifty. Yeah. Um, is it, is there a problem with this as a subtype? Is this going to cause problems as a subtype? Could someone be super surprised by this? That darn it, this thing doesn't get add count. No, no, fine. The subtype is fine. Let's go substitute with both. No problems. No problems with it. But when it comes to inheritance, when it comes to implementation, subclass implementation, things get risky. Let's talk about it. So over here on the left, we have hash set. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, we have the implementation 
Now, this, I'm, let's go up substitution principle. It's just about promises. This is the implementation. This is code, right? Okay. So we have an instrument that has that. And what I'm telling you is this code is risky. The implementation of the code, not the promises. Promises are just fine. It's great. Pass the list of substitution principle with flying colors. But the implementation can be problematic. Why could this be problematic? So look what it tries to do, right? It, the instrument has to try to be nice and good and clever. It reuses the mechanisms of its super class, hash set. So in the instrumented hash set for add, all it does is it, so it keeps around this add count. It's keeping track of how many things have been added to it. Count starting at zero. Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. And if you add something into it, it increments it, right? That's one thing. The add count. You okay? So it says one more, and then it calls off to this ad and half set. Just delegates to, to that. It also writes it, but it, it delegates to this. Ad. Okay. And that's how you do that. Got it. This is super right. Okay. And add all, you're adding an add all with a collection half view. I want to add uh, this whole set of things to it and these objects. And I'm going to increment the ad count by however many things are in that collection and call off to add all. And, and so I just delegate to add all and of the super class. And, and then there's this get add count here, um, which is going to return the number of things that have been added so far. This get add count is the new kid on the block. It's the new thing that's been added by this instrumented hash set. The new bit of nifty functionality beyond this, right? Okay, so I say this is a risky implementation. Why is it risky? Anyone say why is this risky? Alex. Okay, you've got a great idea. So you're calling this at all, right? Now. Alex is exactly right. His intuition is normal. Is, is great. But there's something specifically that could be a problem. I'm not saying this is definitely a problem, but it could be a problem. It depends on the implementation over here in Hasset. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Yes, we'll have. Um, what if the collection has like duplicate elements, but the set only takes one? Oh, oh. Okay, um, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, uh, so good call. I'll give you credit on the exam for that. Um, but but I'm looking for a different issue, Riley. Okay, uh, getting some idea. It depends what's going on here, but it's something different. Something having to do with this point over here about what bar is called. So let's ask this. So suppose, um, let's take a look at that, right? So this, when we call add on an instrument to have set, remember we dispatch off it, we call it on whatever the true type is. So if we have an instrument to have set, someone may think it's just a half set, but it's truly an in, uh, instrument to have set. When we call add in it, it's gonna call this out, right? Good. And that's going to record that it's one more. Um, we've got it one more thing and call off to add in the super class. That's turns out that's fine. Calls off to add. Mm -mm. That's not the like That's great. Mm -mm. Okay. How about add all here? So add all, take a collection. We record, okay, we're, we're adding that many things in. And then we call off to add all with that collection. What could add all do that that could be a problem in in our in our accounting for how many things have been added, Riley? You got it. You got it, Riley. As as a excellent. So if add all were just a loop that calls add, whose add is called? Whose add is called? Subtype. The subtype, the most specific subtype, right? The, the 
the actual type of it, which is instrumented hash set. And so it's going to be calling add here and double counting, right? Right? Yeah. Now, uh, now suppose I told you, well, actually, hash set at all doesn't call add. It, it just manually adds the man one by one. Would this work then? So it doesn't actually call add, it just goes through the work of keeping track of it internally. It doesn't call add, it, so it just does it internally. Is, would that work? Yes, or does that? Okay, so great, great question. Let's let's go through it. So suppose we set add all to a collection that is three elements. Okay. Okay, so calling add all the actual type of it is an instrument to the hash set. We call add all. Um, even though it may appear to us that the hash set is secretly an instrumented hash set, and so it goes, we call the most specific type. That's the add all is being called in the instrument hash set. Okay, yeah. And and it's add count plus equals three, right? Right? Because there's three things in this collection. Mm -hmm. Let's start. And then it calls super dot add all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That calls off here to add all, right? Okay, now suppose as Riley surmised, as Riley feared, add all loops through one by one these three things and calls add, right? On each of them. Whose add is called? The actual types add is called. Dispatch off the actual types. That's this add. And now for each of them, we're adding a count in. So the first one, we've already added three to it. Now we add a four. Then the next one, add five. Next one, add six. And now we return from add all. And we thought we were just doing what the superclass does. But instead, now the superclass is entangled with the subtype implementation. And, and we double counted. Do you, do you see that, Ergosim? Okay. Now suppose, though, so, so that's a risk. Riley is exactly right. He spotted from a mile away. Um, that, that is exactly right. Now suppose Adol didn't call out. Suppose it, it just, you know, whatever data structure is inside a half set, it just sticks them in there anyway. Would it work then? Yeah, it was because it's not calling off, not double count, right? It's not calling off to add, right? So what I'm saying is, should be sobering. What I'm saying is, should perhaps give you a fright. What I'm saying, to chase it in, that here, whether or not our code works in this subtype depends on the implementation of the super code. Maybe we test it and it all works good right now. Mm -mm. Right? But maybe after we're fixing our code, the implementation of hash set, the class hash set changes. So it starts calling add instead of just doing it directly. Okay? Now suddenly our code doesn't work. Because the super type implementation changed. You get that? So, what I'm saying is the implementation of the subtype, its correctness depends on this implementation of the super type. Do we always have access to the code of the super type? No. How many of you have spent hours browsing through Java.object code? <laughs> Not many of us, right? Um, and not only does it correctness now depend on it, but its future correctness could be broken based on some seemingly innocent thing about whether at all calls add or not here. It could break the implementation of a subclass. Do you, do you understand that? This is, this should be disconcerting. This has nothing to do with the Liskov substitution. I mean, Liskov substitution principle is matched fine by this. The promises are fine. The question is, does it successfully implement the promises. It's about implementation, right? Okay, so here's here's another example. 
So we have a superclass whose job in life is singularly simple. It has, it has a method get value, which returns an int, set value, which sets the value of the ints associated with this. And you know, if you set and then get, you'll get the same value back, right? And then is positive, which says whether or not this value is positive. Hmm? The value that's been set there, the value that you would get. Simple idea. I'm not, I haven't specified this fully, but you get the gist of it, right? We can set its value. We set it to minus three, and we get it. We'll get back minus three, right? And if we ask is positive, we know false, right? We set it to three, and and we get it. It'll be three, and if we ask pos is positive, it'll be it, correct, right? Okay. Mm -mm. What's not to like, right? Okay. So now suppose we want to extend it. So we like this idea, but we want to, we want to, maybe we want to do some things that aren't shown here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to have our own value and we're going to call set value and we're going to have our set value takes it in and, and sets our value to, to whatever is passed to it yeah. and get values that will return them. So this implementation the implementation of these methods set value and get value that override them. So if someone is an instance of my simple sub, uh, subclass and we call set value, we'll call this one, right? Or we call get value, we'll call this one. Hmm. And notice we've set them up to, to return the value of this integer field that we've set up, right? So we try to make it self contained. The question is, Will this definitely work or might it work? Or uh, is there a condition under which this would work? Let me ask. You. Yes, well, hi. If we need the value from the super class, we don't really have access to it anymore. Okay, we don't have access, but we've overridden set value and get value. So, right, but they only affect the, 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 like the subclass of variable, right? But what if you need the variable that was in the original? Okay, well, you're getting warm. What what could go wrong here? Notice I overrode two out of the three methods here. What about that third method? What could go wrong here? Yes, Marvin. Um, it's possible we'll look at its value and that might not coincide or probably wouldn't coincide with the new class of value. Okay, good. So I would I would argue is positive might work or it might not work. Under what condition would it work if it did what? If is positive did what to to inspect its value, and that answer. If it, if it, oh, if it does. Yes, yes, uh, Riley said, and, and Wahaj. If it directly calls the field uh, like by name instead of using the get value. Exactly. If it called get value, we, we'd be all fine, right? Because it would use, it would use get value to determine, it would use the specific get value on the particular instance. Uh, the actual type, and it would it report is that positive or not, right? We're, we're, we're fine, it would work fine, right? We get is positive, just we get it for free with these ones here, you know, set value, get value. All we have to do is implement those, and we get the third one for free, right? Buy two, get one for free, right? Okay, now, could you give me a situation where it might not work? Yes, Marmon. It's not you can get how get it following that activity. It just it just whatever it probs here, it, it gets internally without calling get value. Then it doesn't work. You see the pattern. It's the same basic pattern that whether or not our code works as intended depends on implementation details in the super class, which we might not be able to see in code, right? Or even if we see it now, it might evolve, right? It might change in a way that might break it capriciously. Someone in the super class might perfectly reasonable say, well, this calls get value, but I'm gonna avoid that that hassle. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna instead just refer internally to the value here, right? 
um, to to whatever, however it stores it, and and suddenly is positive. It's not going to. It will will not work with our class. We counted on getting, you know, have two buy, you know, buy two get one free, and, and now it no longer works. So their perfectly reasonable implementation optimizations for the superclass might break our subclass. You got that? Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with let's go substitution principle. Nothing to do with the promises. See implementation <clears throat> that could break, and it's because of this inheritance thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So is this? No. It, it's 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 not safe, right? It's it's risky. We don't know whether or not it will work, right? Um. And it's because of the same silly thing, right? I mean, it's like, is positive, it's like food, right? Um, in the sense that when it calls bar, it calls the specific bar. So is positive, if we call it and it calls our get value, we're all fine. Because it's calling our get value. So it's like this, if it's a secretly V, it's calling the bar in V. Um, it's the same basic principle. So subclassing, ladies and gentlemen, without care is, is can be a risky business. Um, subclassing implies subtyping in many contemporary languages. So we have to be careful about what promises we make. We that's what we talked about these, you know, last, you know, just an hour ago in, in the lecture before that, right? We have it's about the promises we make, the contracts is is Fed, is Fred X making a contract compatible with FedEx? Right? That's what that was about. But here we're dealing with implementation, how we subclass and particularly inheritance, right? We we can inadvertently break the behavior of the superclass methods, and we can depend on things like depend on the value of his positive, um that that might change out from under us, right? Um, as you know, it changes what calls what in this method. If, if it is positive, calls get value worth gold up in the subclass. We get it for free. If it doesn't, we don't get it for free. And we have to override it. Right? Um uh, so this is all about implementation. Mm -hmm. Um okay, so. This is an implementation concern. Um, so, you know, uh, generally speaking, a subclass is going to be overriding some methods, um, some methods, and that's the whole point, right? Manef, um, you were saying, you know, much of the goal of subclassing is to get the goodies of the implementation of the superclass. If you had to re implement the superclass, why subclass, right? Um, it's the idea. So, and again, there's some benefit of polymorphism, but but you don't want to just do that. You can use interfaces nicely, for example, in Java or C sharp or what have you. Um, but generally you want to override some methods, but use the rest for free, right? Use the rest, you get them for free. And you generally can't see the code of these methods, you know, consider Java not up, right? Um and these implementation details, like whether or not if positive calls get value, can change at any point, right? Um, and uh, here, you know, we're often relying on the implementation details of superclass methods. What is calling what matters in the superclass, right? We wish we knew here whether if positive calls get value. If only we knew that, we know whether we have to override is positive as well, or whether we can just get it for free by overriding get value. Here, uh, we wish we knew whether at all calls add, right? If at all calls add, we know this is going to double count, right? We don't have to separately add up here. We could just hang on this implementation we don't even have to override at all because we know calling it will we'll automatically add things in with this add count. By contrast, if we know at all does not call add, 
we have to we have to go through this separately. Do you see that? Okay. So this is the the general sort of quandary we're we're in. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to be able to talk about the details of this, but the basic types of approaches that can be used here is you have what's called a subclassing contract. So you basically say, look, you can subclass me, but you need to know these details beyond what someone using an instance of this class is. A sub, someone who wants to subclass it has to have more information. They have to have more information about how it works. Like someone, let me ask this. Someone using an instance of my simple superclass, do they have to know about whether it's positive calls get value? They're using an instance of my simple superclass. Do they have to know about what calls want? No, they don't. As long as it matches the contract, they're fine, right? Here, um, if they're using an instance of, if all they have is a, is a hash set and they're using it, do they have to know if at all cause that? No, they don't have to know. But when you subclass it, now the gloves are off, right? I mean, like you have to know, is that all kind of calling ad or not? Because you're overriding. Do you get that? Okay, so this is a more subtle issue, right? Um, and, uh, you know, to get back to the FedEx franchise, here we're dealing with not just the promises FedEx made, but the implementation, you know, like, like, is it using FedEx's planes? Is it using its IT system? All those sort of things come in, like how we're going to actually achieve these things, okay? Inheritance is like FedEx, FedEx is using all the, all the IT system, the planes, the trucks of FedEx, and that's a more complicated deal. I mean, if it says, no, I want to use my own plane, now it's more complicated because it has to play nicely with the IT system and the trucks need to know to deliver it to the plane and all that sort of stuff, right? It's more than customers need to know. But if you're running Fred X, you need to know this. Customers, all they care about is you meet the guarantees, right? Okay. Um, we're running out of time, but I think I'm giving you a flavor of... of um, some of the issues that come in with subclassing that are distinct from those with subtyping. Now, it turns out there's a bunch of ways to, to, to deal with this, from preventing it to declaring subclass contracts to issues having to do with, and by the way, these are examples in java.util, that abstract list that says, you know, this method is called by this, or you know, that uh, if it finds the element and removes it by calling remove, it actually says how it's calling it, what's calling what. And that's important for subtyping. Um, you can avoid self-use of overridable functionality. So add all doesn't call add, for example. It, it, it avoids that. So it avoids the risk that someone will override it and call it. And then there's something called delegation inheritance versus composition. And it's an alternative to inherit, sorry, delegation. It's, a, it's an alternative to inheritance based on what's called uh, composition. And and I don't have time to, to, to talk about these, okay? Um, but I hope that gives you, you know, some sense that people grapple with these issues and some sense of the risks. It turns out that testing object oriented software needs to grapple with these things. You need to test, for example, not just a subtype, but calling the methods declared by its supertype in order to test it thoroughly. Make sure that you haven't broken those methods that you inherited from or, or are using from the supertype. Okay. Time is running out, though. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been great pleasure to, to be with you this semester for this course. It ain't over yet. <laughs> and I'm glad to meet with the teams, uh, either as stakeholder or as you know, or as class instructor. But I've genuinely enjoyed this class. Now, uh, I think I've enjoyed it because of your hard work, um, your dedication to 
putting into practice uh, the feedback we've given um, and to bearing with, you know, some experimentation with a flipped classroom, trying exercises and having more discussions than we normally do. There have been a lot of rough edges uh, because we're trying this out for the first time. And I'm grateful for you bearing with it. But um, hopefully, you know, you've learned some good things. And uh, I'm hoping that you know, your as your project wrap up, you'll you'll uh, be able to reflect upon a lot of learning from those projects. Right. Um. Uh. I'm very proud of where your teams have gotten to. Um. And uh, I look forward to seeing more. Obviously, when you when you turn them in, but uh, already I can see just a lot of strengths. Um. I'd say more than I've seen in most semesters of three seventy. Um, and it's to your folks' credit. I know it's been a tough semester. It's been a tough semester for everyone. Um, and uh, I applaud your your dedication. I see it in the hours. I see it in the signs of progress. Um, and you know, uh, kudos to you for 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 working through this. Okay. Um, as they say, uh, days remain. If you need to meet with me, let me know. But it's with some regret that I'm going to have to, you know, close this semester of the uh, of the lectures and uh, tutorials for this class. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's see if we can wrap this up in a good style. And uh, I wish you, you know, all the best with your uh, internship placements with your finishing up the projects for other classes, and as you launch your, your careers. Always delighted to talk with students as they go on. Some of you have asked about further involvement in projects. Um, some of you have mind the projects that I serve as sponsor for, and I'm delighted to work with any students in that capacity, but some are no doubt, you know, wondering with Dr. Filipenko, et cetera, uh, knowing her well, uh, I'm always glad if I can be a useful influence in discussion with her and, and shaping that too. So let me know how I can be a resource. Uh, let me know how I can um, further you and your career aspirations. And it has been such a pleasure to, to work with this team. Okay. Thank you very much.